morning, everyone. Morning. Lovely to see you and a very warm welcome to our service here this morning. And a warm welcome to any who are joining us via Zoom and any who might uh, look at the service later via YouTube or another online platform. It's lovely to see you all. And um, we just ask the Lord's blessing on any work or activities that might take place here this coming week. And as it is our communion service, I would like the priest to handle. Our prayer is peace in our hearts and peace in the world. And now it's my very great pleasure to welcome the Reverend Jackie Case to lead us in worship this morning. Jackie, we look forward to sharing this time with you. Good morning. Let us pray. O Lord our God, you expand our world, stretching its boundaries into mystery and wonder, calling us to go deep and beyond, shocking us into silences as we remember our true centre in the midst of life's complexities. You are our God and we come this morning with reverence to worship you. Enter our hearts in this hour, O Lord our God. Be made plain among all our theories of life and all our interpretations of your way. Stand clear in our souls so that our lives may reshape themselves into your clarity, your priorities, and your wisdom. Challenge our sureness, break open the truth, and be known to us here, O Lord our God. Amen. Our opening hymn, and I invite you to sing into your mask, um, is singing the faith number 101, Before the World Began.
be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. Eternal God, with all who have gone before us in the faith, we praise your holy name. With all across the world, in every land, with peoples of every race, every colour and tongue, we sing your praise. With the whole creation, mountain and hill, wood and forest, sea and stream, sun, moon and stars, we proclaim your greatness. We unite with all that is past, all that is around us, and all that is yet to be, so that with creation in all its completeness, we may acknowledge you as our Lord. Amen. And a prayer of confession. Gracious and holy God, we come before you this morning as we do all mornings and all days, knowing how far we fall short of the standard that you have set for us in Jesus Christ. For those thoughts, which are unworthy, for those words which have hurt rather than encouraged, for those actions which have been neglectful or hurtful, we come before you, gracious and holy God, in penitence, in sorrow, in regret. And we ask that through all that you have done for us in Jesus Christ, our Lord, we may be forgiven and renewed, that we may be the people that you have always intended us to be, people who truly reflect your image of love and self-giving. The good news of Jesus Christ is that in him our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'm going to share with you a story from when I was a teacher many years ago. But this story doesn't take place in uh, the classroom. It takes place, actually, out in the wilds of Wales, out in the wilds of the Welsh countryside. Anybody here ever been to Wales? Quite a lot of people. Well, it's very rocky and hilly in some parts of Wales. And I went and stayed in a cottage with a group of my friends who were also teachers in the same school. And we had a wonderful week away, but there was one day which I found particularly hard. Some of the teachers I went with were very experienced walkers, and I wasn't. That was in the days before I had a dog and had to go out for a walk every day. So I was even less fit than I ought to have been. And we set off on this walk and everything was fine while we were on the flat. And then we got to this hill. And the people who were leading the walk were very experienced walkers. Uh, the PE teacher from the school I was teaching in and the head of geography. And uh, they were a married couple. And Ted, the head of geography, was sort of leading the expedition 
And we looked up at this really steep hill, and he said, it's a brilliant view from the top. It's a bit of a hard climb, but if you look carefully, you can see where the grass has been worn in zigzags. We don't have to go straight up. We walk up in zigzags. So we set off up this hillside. And they were way ahead of me, and they started getting further and further and further ahead of me. And I slogged up this path. And by the time I got halfway up this hillside, I just couldn't go any further. I felt as though my lungs were going to burst. I felt as though my knees were going to give way underneath me. And I just stopped, and I sat down on the grass. Somebody else in the party had spotted that I was in trouble, and Ted, the leader of the expedition, the head of geography, came back. Now, he could have said to me, oh, come on, Jackie, you can do it. It's really not that hard. Buck up. He could have said that, but he didn't. He could have said, come on, Jackie, you're spoiling it for everybody else. You've got to make a, more of an effort, and you should have been fitter before you came. You knew we were going to walk. He could have said that, but he didn't. What he did do and say was this. He took his backpack off, and he got out a bottle of water, and he gave me a drink. And they sat down beside me, and he said, I know it's really hard going, Jackie, isn't it? And then he said, but I want you to look at how far you've already come. And so he persuaded me to look down the hillside where I had already come. He said, you're just over halfway, Jackie. Now he said, you could wait here and have a good long rest, and we'll pick you up on the way back because we'll be coming back in the same direction. He said, you've got your picnic lunch, so you can have lunch while you're waiting for us. He said, you could do that. But he said, actually, he said, it's a fantastic view from the top, and I really, really, really want you to see that view. So he said, it's your decision, Jackie. You can stay here and wait for us to come back. Or, he said, now we've had a bit of a rest, he said, I'll walk up the hill with you. Well, I was encouraged by that. I was encouraged by how far I'd already come, because I hadn't realised how far up the hill I'd already got. And I was encouraged by the fact he said he'd do it with me. So we got up and we started to walk up this zigzag path. And when we got two further zigzags up, I was really out of breath. He said, let's stop for a moment. Now just turn around and look and see how far we've come now. And he pointed out the spot on the grass where we'd been sitting. And he said, look how far we've come since then. That's really brilliant. You've done really well. He said, we'll just have a few minutes few minutes stop. The others are at the top and enjoying the view, so they won't mind waiting. And he said, uh, let's, just, let's just pause for a minute. Do you want another drink of water? So I had another drink of water. And then we went a bit further up. And, and then he said, let's just, let's just pause for a minute and turn around. Oh, look, look how much further we've come now. You know, in no time at all, it felt, we were at the top. When we got to the top, everybody gave us a big round of applause. And I was really grateful, and I sat down, and we all had a merry lunch together, and I enjoyed the view while I was eating my lunch, and I vowed that when I got home, I'd do a bit more walking, and I'd get a bit fitter. And then, of course, we set off and came all the way back down the way we'd come. But isn't that a difference? I wonder what my reaction would have been if he had said, come on, Jackie, buck up, you're spoiling it for everybody else. But he didn't do that. He was really encouraging, and he helped me to see how far I'd come, and he walked with me to help me and to encourage me on the way. And how much better would our world be if we all behaved like that when we saw somebody in our family or somebody in our class at school or somebody at work or, or somebody in the church or a neighbour struggling? 
How much better would our world be if we all encouraged each other rather than just criticising and, and telling somebody that you know they should be able to do better? So remember that. I've remembered it, and that must be... Ooh, I think it must be about 40 years ago that happened. And I can still see Ted and me sitting on that hillside, and I can still hear his voice as he encouraged me to go on. Of course, one of the greatest encouragers we have is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I struggle in the Christian life, it's very often Jesus who encourages me and says, come on, I'll, I'll walk with you, I'll do it with you. And so we're going to sing again now uh, the junior church hymn, um, which is Jesus Be the Centre, which is singing the faith 447. <laughs> special blessing on the young people and their leaders as they have their own meeting now and continue to worship you. In Jesus' name, Amen. <coughs> now we're going to have our reading from Mark chapter 7. So I'm reading from Mark chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence a secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. 
Then he told her, For such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spat and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Amen. Human beings are not designed for relentless, challenging activity, whether physical or mental. We need regular breaks and regular rest. Sometimes we can only get through a very hard period by promising ourselves a complete break when we've completed all the training, problem solving, inventing, physical exertion necessary to get through. It's been interesting to hear the Olympic athletes talking about what they do next and how they have a break before they resume their training. But it, the same is true of any kind of exertion including mental exertion. Sometimes we get to the point where we can finally take a break and we heave a huge sigh of relief and then someone else's problem intrudes on our rest. And when that happens, what might our reaction be? Today's Gospel reading, I think, shows this happening to Jesus. And the results have been a challenge to Christian scholars and Christian preachers ever since. Mark tells us that Jesus left the Jewish part of Galilee, in which most of his ministry was taking place, and he went into the largely Gentile coastal area near the city of Tyre. There's no mention of the disciples in this passage, so maybe Jesus has come away this time completely on his own, hoping that in a Gentile area he might stay quietly incognito and have that rest. This is his chance to get right away, not only from the demands of the crowds that followed him, but also perhaps from the demands of teaching the disciples and trying to help them to understand his message. And we know what hard work that must have been from what we read in the Gospels. And so here he is, staying in a house in this area around Tyre. I don't know whether he knew the people there or whether it was a bit like bed and breakfast sometimes when, when we go away to somewhere we don't know. But in any case, he's hoping to be left alone. He's hoping that no one will realise he's there. But even here, 
A needy person has found him and she is seeking healing for her daughter. Now I apologise if what I'm going to say in the next few minutes is shocking to you, but I believe it's the only thing that makes any sense of this story. The problem for Bible scholars and for Christian believers up to the present day is that despite the woman's respectful behaviour to Jesus, she bowed down before him, he seems at best to be offhand or at worst downright insulting in his response to her. Now various reasons, I think they're excuses personally, have been made about this. Oh, say some Bible scholars and preachers, he was just teasing her. He never really intended not to heal her daughter. But he never teased any other person who came to him for healing. Oh, some people say, he was just enjoying banter with her and she shows through her witty answer that she was enjoying it too. Well, come on, she was pretty desperate about the fate of her daughter. I don't think really she was enjoying banter with the person who might be able to heal her daughter. Others say, well, he was testing her faith. He had every intention of healing her daughter. But as a Gentile, she needed to prove her faith and sincerity. Well, he didn't test the Roman centurion in that way, who came asking for healing for his, uh, well, we're not sure whether it was his son or his servant. It depends which gospel account you read. From my point of view, none of those explanations really rings true. If a distressed mother comes to you about her child, you don't tease her about whether she should receive your help or not. Why did this woman's faith need to be tested by an apparent refusal to heal? No one else had received such a test before healing, and she has actually expressed her faith as a Gentile by coming to him, an obvious Jew, and bowing down before him in the first place. And the, hum the humorous banter argument falls flat considering the woman's obvious desperation. A major problem with what Jesus actually said to her was to compare her and her daughter, Gentiles, with dogs. That image that he uses about why should the food of the children be given to the dog. That was a common insult, dog, applied to Gentiles and to Samaritans by Jews. This woman would have known that, and probably she would have been called a Gentile dog before by some arrogant Jew that she had encountered in the past. Some scholars suggest that the Greek word used in this narrative is the diminutive. It means little dog, or even doggy, we might say, which implies a pet relationship with the master and his family who own the table where all the food is. But frankly, I still think that was insulting. I wouldn't like to be called a little dog, would you? Jesus is certainly, it seems, not being his usual gracious self. And I think we have to face up to that. If anyone is being gracious here, it is the woman. She is not allowing the implied insult to affect her, to put her off, to divert her into an angry retort. She may be a Gentile and a woman, which puts her very low in rank uh, beside an, an observant Jew, beneath the dignity of contact with a Jewish rabbi. But first and foremost, she is a devoted mother 
determined to do anything, to endure anything, to fight in any way that she needs to, to get healing for her daughter. Fortunately, she's also intelligent and witty enough to turn Jesus' metaphor about the dogs and the children against him. His argument is that his mission is firstly to the Jews, and she doesn't dispute that. She doesn't dispute that his fellow Jews should be the primary recipients of his ministry. But, she implies by her remark, there are some occasions when a little of what he has to offer can be spared for those outside the covenant community of Israel, like the crumbs that drop from the family meal that are picked up by the dogs. Resistant as we may be to the idea that Jesus did not always have the right answer straight away, and that's what this story is really about, here he certainly does appear to have changed his mind as a result of the woman's argument. She, on this occasion, understands the true nature and the porous limits of his mission better than Jesus does at this precise moment. God's grace, she points out to him, using the metaphor that he's already introduced, is available to all. So what can we learn from this? Well, I think it points to the humanity of Jesus. Jesus was having an off day. Perhaps not as bad an off day as you or I might have, but an off day nevertheless. And it points to his humanity. But for us, also, we can learn a lesson. We can learn two important lessons from this. For the sake of effectiveness or order, we often have to put limits on what we can do. Charities have to make heartbreaking decisions all the time because of limited resources, both in terms of personnel and finance. But there are occasions when a need presents itself to an aid worker with such immediacy and such moral power that that need cannot be denied. A very current example, for all the regulation of immigration into the UK that has been tightened up over the past few years, and concern over this nature, nation's limited housing and other resources, very few people could deny the need to accept refugees from Afghanistan in large numbers over the next few years. Or, perhaps on a more personal level, However busy we may be with work or family or children or good works, a next door neighbour in need of urgent and immediate help has a powerful call upon our time and energy. We have to be like the Samaritan who didn't walk on by and not, by the, and not like the busy priest and Levite who felt they had better things to do and walked, walked along, on the, passed by on the other side of the road. One further example we could take from this story, and I think it's a very important one, given our human nature, is how to lose an argument. So often, when someone else's argument is clearly expressed and obviously better than ours, we still cling, don't we, to our defeated point of view, continuing to argue it in justification of what we were saying. Jesus here in this story doesn't do that. For saying that you may go, 
the demon has left your daughter, he says in the revised, uh, in the, the, new, the new revised standard version from which I generally work. In our terms, what he is saying is, you win. On this occasion, you're right about what God wants. Go home. God has healed your daughter through me. So next time, when each one of us feels that we are losing an argument, especially about matters of faith, let's not cling stubbornly to our view simply because it is ours. Let us accept that God speaks through others and thus corrects and perfects our understanding of God's will both for us and for others. And that, of course, is why Christian fellowship, discussion, honest and open discussion in small groups, is so important in fostering the development of our faith. Amen. We come now to our prayers of intercession. I will leave some silences um, for you to make your own particular prayers to God. Um, it's difficult to uh, do that aloud because I, would, I will have to repeat everything for the Zoom congregation. So make your own private prayers to God in the silence on this occasion. If you'd like to fetch it for me now, that would be great. Thank you. There will be a response for the prayers. Uh, the response is, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So it's a very well-known one. Thank you. Let us pray. In the clash and clamour of life, loving God, we come into the peace of your presence. In the harsh and forbidding pain so often known in our world, we draw near to hear your still small voice of healing and of grace. Gracious God, may the peace of your presence and the voice of your grace give us power and strength to meet the pain of the world in Christ's name. God of justice and compassion, we pray for the leaders of the nations, thinking especially of lands where there is warfare, hunger, injustice, oppression. We hold before you those places that have been brought to our notice this week by items in the news, in newspapers, on the television, on the radio, in magazines. And we hold them before you, gracious and holy God, in faith. May those in authority see leadership not only as the getting and the wielding of power, but as the fulfilment of a calling to serve their country and better the lives of their people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of hope and salvation, 
We pray for the church, for this congregation, for the people here in this church and churches in this locality and throughout the world. And we hold before you, gracious and holy God, those known to us who are in special need at this time. Irene Ashworth, Sylvia Benham, Karen Inglesford, Alan King, Phyllis Labaius, Ham Parsons, Christopher Wooten. And we remember to those from the church family known to us as individuals. May we be united in obeying your call to be servants of the gospel, proclaiming the good news of your forgiving love to all the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of power and love, we pray for ourselves and our loved ones, remembering those who are sick, sorrowful or anxious. Gracious God, each and every one of us has needs that are not known to the, uh, those around us, and needs perhaps that are not even well known to ourselves. Help us by the power of your indwelling Holy Spirit to be strengthened and comforted, healed and forgiven, that we may be enabled to follow our calling to love and serve, and that our actions, our words and our prayers may be inspired by that same Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask these prayers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we prepare ourselves for communion, uh, we are going to sing that lovely hymn, singing the faith number 615, Let Love Be Real. Let love be real in giving and receiving Without the need to manage and to own A haven free from pulsing and pretending Where every weakness may be safe Oh, so 
Let love be real, not grasping or confining. That strange embrace, that holds yet sets us free. That helps us face the risk of truly living. And makes us brave to be what we little communion pack is there anyone who hasn't got one if you haven't just put your hand up I'm sure there are some that can be delivered to you I'm going to use a communion liturgy from the We Worship book, which is uh, one of the liturgies that's sometimes used in uh, Iona Abbey. make us whole. The responses to my next few words will be familiar to you, so please feel free to join in with them. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, O Lord our God, for you made us, and before us you made the world we inhabit, and before the world you made the eternal home in which through Christ we have a place. All this is spectacular, sorry, all that is spectacular, all that is plain, have their origin in you. All that is lovely, all who are loving, point to you as their fulfilment. And grateful as we are now for the world we know and the universe beyond our knowledge, we particularly praise you whom eternity cannot contain for coming to earth and entering time in Jesus, for his life which informs our living, for his compassion which changes our hearts, for his clear speaking which contradicts our harmless generalities, for his disturbing presence, his innocent suffering, his fearless dying, his rising to life, breathing forgiveness. We praise you and we worship you. And here too our gratitude rises for the promise of the Holy Spirit, who even yet, even now, confronts us with your claims and attracts us to your goodness. And therefore, we gladly join our voices to the song of the church on earth and in heaven. Holy. Merciful God, send now in kindness your Holy Spirit to settle on this bread and wine and to fill them with the fullness of Jesus. And let that same Spirit rest on us, converting us from the patterns of this passing world until we conform to the shape of him whose food we now share. Amen. Among friends gathered round a table, Jesus took bread and broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Let us join together in receiving these elements with thanksgiving. Later, he took a cup of wine and said, This is the new relationship with God, made possible because of my death. Take it, all of you, who remember me. Jesus, firstborn of Mary, have mercy on us. Jesus, Saviour of the world, have mercy on us. Jesus, Monarch of Heaven, grant us peace. He whom the universe could not contain has been present to us in this bread. 
He who redeemed us and called us by name has met us in this cup. We have taken this bread and this wine, and in them God has come to us so that we may come to God. In gratitude, in deep gratitude, for this moment, this meal, these people, we give ourselves to you. Take us out to live as changed people because we have shared the living bread and cannot remain the same. Ask much of us, expect much from us, enable much by us, encourage many through us. So, Lord, may we live to your glory, both as inhabitants of earth and as citizens of the commonwealth of heaven. Amen. Our concluding hymn is singing the faith number three, Eternal God, your love's tremendous glory. shared like his, Christ's life in our hands, our lives shaped by his, Christ's love in our heart, our love warmed through his, Christ's peace on our path, our path following his. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy